Thank you. <laughs> This is our official date night. We did go to dinner before, though. I don't think I got off that easy. But uh, thank you, Nahal. You know, my daughter I was asking me the other day, I forgot where I took her where I was speaking. She's like, Daddy, how do you not get nervous when you speak? And it's simple. My wife's never there, so it's easy. <laughs> so tonight might be different. A <laughs> warning, right? So what's tonight's topic? Anybody know? Or I could just make it up. No? OK, great. <laughs> What do you think is the, one of the most important traits in life? In every aspect of life, by the way. Discipline. Discipline. Oh, that's a good one. I like that. Growth. Oh, shh. You guys are doing a good job, Rabbi. And positive attitude. Okay, good, good. We're going to talk about that. Resilience. Resilience. Good. Truth. This is part of that. Truth. What's that? Truth. Truth, okay, good, good. <coughs> Underrated in today's society. <laughs> Anything else? Okay, so what do you think of when I say positivity bias? What does that mean to you? Um, maybe like when you see on Instagram, like everyone's having a great time. You know, are they really? Right? I, I, we had a uh, friend, actually, Nahal was telling me, our friend's divorced, and it was Valentine's Day. And she said something on Facebook like, you know, it's so cute, everybody's got these beautiful posts, and everyone's having a great time. Well, I'm going to post that I'm not having a great time. <laughs> it was really sad, but funny at the same time. You know, it was like real. <laughs> got to edit that from the video. <laughs> but, but it was real, you know, it was the truth. So positivity bias is basically a way of thinking a way of thinking that'll make every facet of our life better. Whether it's interpersonal relationships, whether it's in business, in everything. Studies have shown by thinking positively, we increase our lifespan, our health, better psychologically, right? We're not as messed up as the rest of the world, right? But it's got ramifications in every area of life. The Pirkei Avod, anybody heard of Ethics of the Fathers? Okay, good. So in chapter 2, Mishnah 5, I believe, they asked, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai asked his students for the best trait in life. And there's five opinions. And one of them is what? Guys, we just talked about the topic of the class. Good! Why did you give that away? <laughs> Positivity, a good eye. Because it's literally one of the best traits in life. Tonight we'll talk about, do we have that or not? How are we naturally? And then we'll get to five ways to cultivate that in ourselves, All right? So are we positive? First of all, do we think it's important? Do you like, raise your hand if you like to hang out with a naysayer or a person who's always upbeat and excited and happy about life? Which one do you rather hang out with? Yes, right. We don't want fakeness. We're saying real, like you're really, really genuinely. Yes, up being excited. Right? Up being excited. So, why is it that we're not like that, most of us? Most, most times in life, we're just. Because we're human. You know, Rabbi Torsky, because we're human. <laughs> Good. Right? Rabbi. Really? Well, yeah, Milwaukee. Oh, yeah, Milwaukee. Yeah, he was based in Milwaukee. Good job. <laughs> You really did meet him. <laughs> so Rabbi Torsky is, is a, he was, may he rest in peace, that's all. He wrote a lot of great books. My wife's favorite marriage book is written by him. First year of marriage. Highly recommend it, even before you're married. She made me read it like eight times. But <laughs> he says something amazing. If I put up a white piece of paper with a little black dot, and I ask each and every one of you here, what do you see? What would you say? The black dot. A white page. Even though, <laughs> even though it's 99% white. It's like I get in trouble for just that. <laughs> but, right? Why is that? Because we all get our traits. The Bible has the secrets to everything. Adam and Eve, what was Adam's mistake? Eating the fruit. Okay. Okay, that's, that's a... It's a very uh, sexist uh, <laughs> answer. <laughs> I'm 
glad I didn't say that, but yeah. <laughs> There's one opinion. You know, Rashi says in chapter 3, verse 12 of Genesis, Rashi says something amazing. It wasn't eating from the tree. It wasn't listening to Eve. It wasn't any of those things that we mentioned. It was what? Curiosity. When God confronted him and asked him, what did you do? What did he say? The woman that you gave me. Right. Not only did he blame, did he not take responsibility, he blamed his wife, and by saying you gave me, he's blaming God. Rashi says he was an ingrate. I can't say that. Well, Rashi said it, so we can repeat it. Right? He's an ingrate. How could he say that? God gave him a wife. A part, could you imagine how depressing it would be to live in the world, have the Garden of Eden all to yourself with no one to enjoy it with? The Gemara says you, you don't see happiness, true happiness. This is ADD. Rabbi Mullah says he does it with you guys, so I'm okay doing it. You don't see true happiness until you're married. For some people, it's the opposite. We won't get into that. <laughs> but real marriage, a true partnership, is real joy. That's the, the first moment you'll see joy. I think I said it last time, Nahal and I, when we had our first daughter, it's okay, I can embarrass her with stories now that she's here. We, uh, I remember just, she was a baby, she was always in our bed, watching Elmo. <laughs> Probably shouldn't have had her do that. <laughs> no wonder if she's addicted to TV. But I remember just looking at Nahal and I was like, I can't believe I said I love you, like when we were dating. It was so silly. Because the feeling I have for you now is exponentially greater than what it was, you know, even a year into dating, right? And so that's, that's the concept of Adam. That was a mistake. He saw the negative. He didn't see the positive that, oh my goodness, God gave me this spouse. He saw the negative. Same thing with the Jews in the desert, right? It's in our DNA to kvetch. Anybody knows what kvetch means? Complain. It's in yet, right? It's a very Jewish trait. <laughs> kvetch, we complain. It's amazing. I say this in a Persian crowd and people look at me like I'm from outer space, like, <laughs> did you just mispronounce a word? <laughs> like, no, man, Google it. <laughs> Don't you have a Yiddish English dictionary? <laughs> so, kvetching. Tisha B'Av, we have continuous example after example in the Bible of the Jews complaining for no reason. Because we are programmed to see the negative. And it's all about our perspective. And I'll read you a line Hasidic thought, it's not events of our lives that shape us, but the meanings that we assign to those events. In other words, if we change the way we look at things, the things you look at change. And Tony Robbins caught on to this, and his version of this saying is, life is 10% what happens to us, 90% how we interpret it. All right? So it's really all about how we see things. For example, is a knife good or bad? Depends. Is a marriage good or bad? Can't answer that. <laughs> Depends what you use it for, right? You know, it's fascinating. Baby makes three. John Gottman. Dr. Gottman wrote a book about people who have a babies. Like, the baby makes three in the, in the relationship, right? There's husband, wife, right? We're good with math. Good. So, he, sh he shows studies have shown that I believe it was like 66, 60 something percent of couples after they have a baby, relationship just tanks. And the other 30-something percent shoots up. It's all about how we perceive things. It's all about how we perceive things. So why are we so negative? You know, our, uh, our daughter just started a new school. Well, it seems like she just started. She just ended school. But she started it in the beginning of the year, which is over now. She'd come home, and the first question a parent asks his daughter is what? How's your day? Today, especially an 8-year-old who seems like a 15-year-old, right? How's your day? <laughs> And usually, what's 9 out of 10 the answer we get? Oh, God willing, inshallah. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> right? What do you get? You find out this thing happened, and this drama happened, and this girl was braiding this girl's hair, and... Right, they're hungry. <laughs> I told you, give her a snack. The trick is first give them food. First give them food. Well, now we know for next year. <laughs> Too late for this year. But 
But think about it. You know, her day couldn't have been that miserable. But she focuses on the one thing that happened. And I asked her, I even, like, literally, I'm like, okay, so this, like, 10 seconds of this girl braided someone else's hair and not your hair, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know? What else happened in the day? Nothing else. <laughs> it's, it's an eight-hour day. <laughs> you know, like, that's it. And because of that, the day is terrible? Like, really? <laughs> hey, oh, yeah, that's for sure nothing. <laughs> Are the kids still learning the olive bed after one year of uh, tuition? I'm glad that was worth every dollar. Uh -oh. <laughs> he's, he's at Gimel now. We're making progress. <laughs> so, <laughs> shoot, I, know, I might be at the dog house making fun of him. <laughs> he's our favorite. So, why do we see the negative? Why is it we're like that? Psychologically, first of all, a tzaddik falls seven times and gets back up. King Solomon said. We're going to fall. It's all about how we react to it. Neuroscientists have found out that our brains process positive and negative information in completely different ways. Negative information, they've developed specialized circuits that register negative experiences immediately in emotional memory. It's like locked into the hard drive. Whereas positive experiences just flow like water. And, and I think that's even stronger in women, by the way, but that's a separate topic. <laughs> But it's, we don't remember the positive nearly as much as we remember the negative. Why? It's a function of survival. Could you imagine we were in the jungle? We were, you know, a thousand years ago, right? There's a lion around the corner. <laughs> you know, there's, a, there's a, a group of wolves in the other side of the Amazon. And I don't know if they're in the Amazon or not. And we need to remember all of these negative things, these threats. Today, we don't have those threats but we're programmed to remember the negative more than the positive because that's just how we've evolved. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. right, you're on social media. This is like today's example of a, of a line, right? <laughs> and, and you can have a great time the whole day. And somebody showed me TikTok the other day. Really cool, by the way. <laughs> Props to your generation. And, and, and you can just have a great day and every, all of a sudden somebody, one person doesn't like your whatever thing, right? And it ruins the day. That's how we're programmed. Ever have an early flight and you can't sleep that night because you're worried you're going to miss the flight? Yes, I know, honey. Yes, right there. <laughs> Anybody else other than my wife? Just make her feel good? No, I, I don't sleep at night. You don't sleep, right? Yeah, I'm not going to sleep. What, what, what's your name? Gabby. Gabby. Have you ever missed a flight? Never. Okay. I did, going home from Israel. <laughs> she always breaks every example. <laughs> So we'll stick with Gabby's example. No, but I never, like, me and timing at the other I can't be late. Can't be late. You missed the flight because of the day difference, right? It was after yeah. midnight? Yeah. I guess everybody. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's a good excuse. But, but Gabby, as an example, can't sleep at night, yet she's never missed this flight. Now, logically speaking, it doesn't make sense. But there's a lot of people like that my wife included, right? We, we are nervous about the flight. Myself too sometimes. If I have a big meeting the next morning, I got to wake up and the hall knows. Like, I'm just like, how am I even going to go to sleep? So it's because, again, we have that system set up in our mind. Have anybody heard of the peak end rule? What? Peak end rule. A Nobel Prize winning psychologist, Daniel Kahneman, Kahneman, probably Jewish, he came up with this thesis. And it goes this, this way. A person is most likely to remember an event or experience as positive or negative based on its ending. Right? You got into a fight with someone. And you just, you've been, you know the person 10 years. You've been a great friend. Because this last fight, he's a terrible person in your book. Peak end rule. Or you see a movie, it's all about the ending. They live happily ever. Why? That's all you remember. Peak end rule. So it, that's why Pierre Calvert says, judge the entire person. If it done it, kol ha'adam. Kol ha'adam, which is redundant. Because everyone is good or bad. But if we really want to have a positive lens in life, it's what do we focus on? It's what do we focus on? The, the Rebbe said, by the way, this is based on a book called Positivity Bias. I highly recommend it. It's a really good book. It's very good. It's online for free. So you literally don't even have to spend a dollar. You have a long flight coming up, I hear. 
So I have two extra copies. There you go. There you go. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's basically a book on how to think positively. And the Rebbe himself, Lubavitcher Rebbe said, he had to train himself to think positively or else he wouldn't survive. Right? They give an example. One day, the Rebbe unfortunately had a heart attack. His doctor told him, the Rebbe used to give a big speech, I think it was Simchat Torah, if you go give the speech, there's a 25% chance you're going to have a heart attack and that's not good news at your age. And the Rebbe looked at him and smiled. And the doctor was probably shocked at that point because nobody smiles at that news. And he said, so you're telling me there's a 75% chance I won't have a heart attack? <laughs> and that was it. I know the rest of the story, but he didn't have a heart attack and die there. So that's good news. <laughs> Happy ending. Peak end. Right? But his perspective is like glass half empty, glass half full. I mean. Exactly. Yeah. He was, you know, a group of, oh, we'll just digress, a group of uh, women were Chabad girls were in the airport. I think it was Denver. I forget which airport. Friday afternoon. And like, Rebbe, Rebbe, we're, we're, our flights are canceled, blah, blah, you know, we can't get home. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? We're in the airport. We're stuck. They, they asked the secretary, and the secretary said, to the Rebbe, Rebbe said, a Jew is never stuck. A Jew is right where they're meant to be. Do you have candles on you? Go, go give them out. <laughs> of course they do, right? It's like, you have deodorant, toothbrush, candles, right? Of course they do. So... <laughs> <laughs> It's not on already? Come on. <laughs> of course they did. So they ran around the airport giving out candles. Right? That's what they did. That's what they're meant to do. So Chaim Saban says it best. And by the way, this is a very common trait, this positivity bias in almost any CEO or successful person you'll meet or learn about or read about has this trait. They're not a downer. Right? Chaim Saban. He says, most of my success has been due to rejection. Whenever someone says, that's not going to work, I say, oh, I'm onto something. He just sees it differently. Okay. In the interest of time in our lovely mother-in-law babysitter, what are the five practical steps of developing this in ourselves? Can anybody think of one? You got a one out of five chance. <laughs> Very good. Very good. So you, you're onto it. The smiling starts somewhere. So actually what you're saying, so you're saying is, is not one of my five, but it's actually true. Masilat Yisharim, Path of the Just says, fake it till you make it, basically. The chitzoniut mo'oreret et apnimiut. Your outwardness, outwardness, right? You fake a smile, it'll, I know you're probably not liking this, but it'll internally make you happier. I don't know if this is like related at all, but it, you know, there's it's like, fine. none of this is. It takes less muscles to form a smile than it is so oh. it's like, it, it, as long as like you appear happy, I mean, eventually maybe you'll start to feel, I don't know if that actually is true. Um, I was about to say it. Like, but you, you, you feel it. Look, when you start smiling, it just gets to you. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, another one would be happy is to do for other people. Good. Doing for others, right? CNN had a study that you actually get more pleasure giving $20 than receiving $20. Yeah. Not shocking, right? You get a lot more pleasure that way. You know, we were just at Pat's, and we got, uh, one of my friends was there, and it was his birthday, so I got him a bottle of wine. And then um, I thought Miguel, <laughs> the Pat's guy was messing with me that Pat's paid for my bill. <laughs> and I felt so bad, Miguel. And I was like, no, like, I don't want, you know, the restaurant to pay for my bill. Like, that's not cool. Like, I felt so bad receiving. You hear? Because... It's so much more fun to give. Right? It's so much more fun. Sonem atanoti King Solomon says. One who hates gifts, by the way, nothing's free. <laughs> Nothing is, you, you get a gift from someone, you're going to owe them. Because that's human nature. You love where you give. Well, that's a separate time. I was dating. I was a month ago, right? So the first thing, I think you hit it with the smiling, is thinking. What do we think about? Because before this comes out, something happens here. As we read every Friday night, every action starts with a thought. I think also that if you like, um, show positivity to the world, you also attract positivity to yourself. So. Mm -hmm. 100%, yeah. 
I mean, if you, yeah, 100%. If you're showing that, if you're exuding that aura, you're going to get that back, right? Uh, Mrs. Stieglitz, she says, if you don't want these things in your life, don't think about them. It's an amazing line. You know, we, as, as observant Jews, you're not supposed to look at certain things, right? You're not supposed to do certain things. You're not supposed to say certain things, let alone eat certain things, but don't even think certain things. You know, Nahal's uncle, his wife has a rule in the house, we don't talk about sad things or negative things. Yes, they don't speak much. <laughs> it's a very quiet dinner, we just sit there, <laughs> we all look at each other, nod. <laughs> but no, seriously, it's, it's, a really, it's a really nice thing, and they're not religious at all. Yeah. releasing any like frustration or Ra- talking through your feelings. You're absolutely right. Rabbi Israeli quoted a Gemara that says that when you share something, it's like unburdening yourself. When you say something to a friend that is bothering you, it's literally like taking off a burden from your shoulder. Yeah. So there's truth to that. But again, we don't want to be fixated on that though. Yeah, there's like a limit. If briefly talk about it, then yeah. not obsess over it, then yeah. <clears throat> So that's thinking. The second thing is Lashon Tov, speaking positively. You know, when the Torah talks about unkosher animals, my friend brings this, it first says the positive trait, the kosher trait of the animal, and then what makes it non-kosher. For example, the pig has split hooves, but doesn't chew its cud. Just say it doesn't chew its cud, <laughs> right? It's teaching us to always talk positively. Always put the positive first. Just put the positive. ABCs of reprimanding your kid, right? You idiot, yeah, you don't say that. <laughs> Unless you're smart, you get a pass, but uh, you just don't say that, right? What are you supposed to say? Doesn't always work. You're supposed to say, you're, 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 you're too good for that. That, that. That's beneath you, like that's not what, you know, Asher does. We had this incident this morning, <laughs> right? That's not what you do. It's not behavior behooving you. Speak positively. Raise them to a different level. That's Lashon Tov. And neuroscientists have found out that a single word has the power to influence the expression of genes that regulate physical and emotional stress. Words have power. Words have power. Third part. Somebody mentioned this, by the way, the answer to number three, when we asked what the class is going to be about. What do you think the third component is? Gratitude. Wow, how would you guys know? <laughs> so smart. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Pretty impressive. You remember something from 10 minutes ago. That's good. You said that we were going to talk about it. Oh, yeah, good point. Okay, fine. <laughs> Taking away the credit. Okay, fine. <laughs> you know what was the Lubavitcher Rebbe's favorite prayer in the whole entire world? Modani. Modani. Who said that? Oh, yeah, you read the book. Good job. Modani. It's, it's what we read. The first thing we say in the morning is, Mode, I am grateful to God. Modani lefanecha. Doesn't have Hashem's name in it, by the way. It's not one of the, you know, in terms of high levels of prayers. I mean, the Amida, the Shema. It's not even in the Torah, Modani. But it teaches us such an essential lesson in life. That to be positive, we have to be grateful. Be grateful. The fourth thing is one of my favorites. This is going to be a hard one to get. You can still try. Right? <laughs> so I'll be quiet. Hmm? Okay. Rabbi Zelik Pliskin, who I hope you meet in East Jerusalem. He's amazing. He's like a, a ball of just joy. <laughs> like, right? I don't know how to express, explain him. He has tapes and lectures on this topic. And Chris Vaz, have you heard of Chris Vaz? Chris Vaz is one of the top negotiators. He's, he's got a lot of uh, New York Times bestseller books. He was an FBI negotiator. <coughs> Super cool guy. Talks about how to negotiate and basically convince people of what you want. So one of the traits that make us positive is something called reframing. Okay? I'll tell you how Chris Vaz explains. It gives an analogy, right? Frame the situation. You're at Target. Your kid is throwing a tantrum for a PJ Masks toy, mm-hmm. right? And you don't want to give in to him. 
So what do you say? I'm still trying to figure this out, by the way. <laughs> what do you say? If we don't get that toy, it's not kosher. Oh, that's the best. <laughs> Literally, if it's any food item you just don't want to get, it's not going to. But daddy, it has the O in the U. No, no. They catch on fast. They catch on. Like, no, no, no. It needs to have the O in the K. So, so, you just keep switching between them. So, what do you do? You tell them, you know, you can't buy that toy, but you'll get more money for ice cream. You're reframing the situation from a negative to a positive. You're not losing out on the toy, you're gaining on the ice cream. ice cream. And in everything in life, there's a way to do that. This is, this is my favorite one, by the way. The Rebbe, somebody complained to the Rebbe that he never experienced goodness in his life. It's a guy who's married with kids, from the book also. And his house is a mess. It never happens in our house, by the way. His kids are throwing tantrums. His, his wife isn't cleaning up. He's just giving it, you know, just laying it out there. And I'll read you what the Rebbe said. Now, Rebbe was a very sweet person. <laughs> it might not come off that way from this letter. but from a, For a man whom God blessed with a wife and children, to say that he has never seen any good is ungrateful to an alarming degree. Hundreds, even thousands of people pray every day to be blessed with children or give up everything to even have one single child and not merited it. And, I, and again, the Rebbe himself didn't have a child. So you can imagine he's speaking from, from somewhere within. How could you complain? Right? It's reframing. You have, a, you have kids. As a rabbi in the Gemara, his wife was so bad that the rabbis in the Gemara knew how bad she was. Right? It's a whole nother level. And they said to him, why do you buy gifts for your wife? Why do you treat her so nicely? You know, she goes down like in the Gemara is like one of the top three worst wives. <laughs> you know, it's like, a, it's, it's, you, gotta, you gotta be on a certain level. And he says to him, he says to the, this rabbi, he says, what do you mean? She brought me kids. She's my wife. She's a companion. How, how dare I not be appreciative? It's such a different way of reframing. You know, so many of us focus on the negative and we don't see that. You know, the word ashil, who is rich? The one who's happy with what he has. Ashir, Ayn, Shin, Yud, Resh. Somebody I was walking from Shul, and he's telling me something cute he heard. Ayn stands for Enaim. Eyes, Shinaim. Shin is Shinaim. Yadaim, Raglaim. Mm -hmm. Ashir stands for basically your, your eyes, your teeth, Shinaim, Yadaim, your hands, your and your feet, your health. You have that, you're rich. You're richer than the billionaire who's sitting in a hospital bed. Except you your health. And I'll tell you something, I haven't had any alcohol, but I'll still get personal. <laughs> in my own life, you know, this is, this is in memory of uh, Tzipor Bat Yitzchak, my mother. She passed away uh, two months ago. And at first it was very sad. It's still sad. But at first it was really, it was a lot. And I was reading a book, which I highly recommend everybody to read. Whenever I go through life challenges, this is like my drug. It's funny, we, uh, this happened Pesach. The day after, it was a day or two after, our neighbor comes, drives by, and she opens a can of like mints and gives me, and I'm like, why is she giving me mints, you know? And I'm like, oh, it's probably not kosher, like it's Pesach, you know? Like, I'm gonna, it's like, it's like these little gummy bears in mint packages. Then I realized, <laughs> it was like gummies. Another person the night before came and gave me, said I could prescribe you pills. Those were what I said. <laughs> you know, do I have a disease? I said, no, it'll help with the pain. It'll help you go to sleep. It's just a band-aid. Right, it's just a band-aid. Dealing with the pain is much healthier than just band-aids. And that's in everything in life. We'll face challenges that might seem insurmountable. But if we don't face them today, we'll face them tomorrow. Because they won't go away. You know, there's a guy I'm trying to help. It's, it's really bothering me. He's a mess. He's a mess, but he can't confront his challenges. He's resorting to different drugs, etc., and I can't get him to confront his challenges. Once he goes over that hill, he's going to be like a superstar. But that's life. So when this happened, my drug is a book called Duties of the Heart. It's Duties of the Heart, Shara Bitachon, Gates of Trust. 
I have it in like three different copies, okay? I really like this book. I bought 22 copies if anybody needs. Got a little carried away, but whatever. And uh, sorry, it's in my trunk. Don't worry, it's not at home. <laughs> the house is already. Uh, and, and the book said something amazing. I think it was a Chazonisha was quoting. That in life, when we lose something precious, rather than saying, God, why'd you do this to me? You say, God, thank you for letting me have this precious thing for the amount of time I had it. Because at the end of the day, everything's in God's hands. And when we reframe the situation to say rather than I'm entitled to everything, why'd you take this away? Why, why, why did I even deserve 63 years of this amazing mother and person in my life? I didn't do anything to deserve that. I was just born. I was a, trust me, I was a tough child. Right? But that's reframing. That's the most extreme example, by the way. Everybody in the crowd always throws that extreme example. There you have it. It's as extreme as it gets, but it really helps. Because it's the truth. Because that is part of life. Mark Lore, anybody heard of him? Yeah, we're taking it down a notch, don't worry. Mark Lore was the uh, founder of diapers.com, and then he sold that for $545 million to Amazon. Then he founded a company called Jet. I actually met him once in person. I told him how one of his speeches, I connected it to Moshe Urbano, et cetera. He had no idea what I'm talking about. Uh, and <laughs> he sold the second company for $3.1 billion to, to Walmart. And he says something fascinating. He was literally on the brink of just losing it all because Amazon, when he had diapers.com, Amazon was competing with him and Amazon was losing money on diapers just to get this guy out. And he said something, if you're gonna take anything out of this, this one line is amazing. Only when you have your life on the line do you get out of fourth gear and go into sixth gear, right? Reframing that challenge we have, that's what's gonna push us to that, to, to, to discover something within us we didn't even know existed. We didn't know it even existed, right? You know, two years ago, I went through a business challenge. I didn't even know I had the, the fortitude to just even be sane. Thank God for now, right? That's what he's saying reframe these situations because they're all, God doesn't give us a challenge we can't pass. Reframe them, how can we get the most out of it? What is it there to do? And then how do I use that as fuel to propel myself? And this, this is one of my favorite, and we'll go to number five and we're done. My favorite stories of reframing. Bob Iger was the CEO of Disney. And he knew he has an issue with Disney animations. He's got to figure out a way. They're just not doing well. And they had a partnership with Pixar, which fell through. Pixar CEO of Pixar is who? Was Steve Jobs. And Bob figured in order for Disney Animations to be successful, he needs to acquire Pixar. So he flew over to meet with Steve Jobs at Apple headquarters at a huge whiteboard. And Steve Jobs and him were sitting there, or standing, writing down the pros and cons of the deal. By the way, Rev. Noah Weinberg, that's all, the founder of Ace, used to say always in life, when you're, you have a challenge, you have a situation, you have a dilemma, write the pros and cons. Write the pros and cons. Sounds simple, but overlooked. So they wrote the pros and cons. And at the end of the meeting, there was like a whiteboard full of cons and a handful full of pros. So Bob just kind of, you know, tucked his head and said, you know, I'm sorry to waste your time. I, I thought it was a good idea. Clearly it's not, you know. Stay in touch. And Steve said to him, wait a minute, where are you going? He's like, <laughs> he's like no, no, he, he, those pros outweigh all those cons. And he set him up with meetings with different board members and the rest was history. Disney ended up acquiring Pixar. But it, Steve Jobs had that ability to reframe, to see that positive when it was blatantly negative in front of him. The last one is, this is one of my wife's favorite lines actually, think good and it shall be good. The Tzemach Tzedek said that, think good and it shall be good. What does it mean? The, 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 the conviction that God will make everything work out for the best, which by the way, doesn't always mean 
it will seem the best, right? But believing that my mindset will shape reality. Rabbi Nachman of Breslov used to say, if you believe that you can ruin, then believe that you can fix. In other words, instead of focusing on the negative, concentrate on the positive. Right? A lot of times we're so hard on ourselves. Oh, I was so lazy today. Oh, this is the best. Oh, I ate so poorly today. I'm such a slob. Right? I had this Danish in the morning. I had this in the morning. Well, if you believe that you can eat this poorly, guess what? You can, you can eat a healthy lifestyle too. Right? If you're that focused on eating and that you're cognizant of what you're eating, you can be cognizant for the positive. You could easily be cognizant for the positive. It's one of my favorite. You heard of Charlie Harari? He's a big motivational speaker. He became observant a lot of part through age. Rav Noach. He met Rav Noach Weinberg at the top one day. Rav Noach Weinberg asked him. He still liked to, 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 get, to get you thinking. He said, can you change the world, Charlie? It's like, I can change the world, you know? So you sure you can't change the world? He says, okay, maybe I can change the world. He kept going back and forth, back and forth. But Noah Weinberg said a line that will give you the chills. He said, if one man can kill six million, then one man can save six million. That is the power of one man. Right? From the negative, we can see the power we have in the positive sense. And you see people doing that all the time. You see people around us, how much they've built how much they've done in their life. All right, it's all about what color of our glasses. We'll end with a story. The first black woman elected to Congress, okay, was in 1968. Her name was Shirley Chisholm. And when she was elected, it was pretty, she was elected in the District of New York. And she was put in the most amazing committee ever. Which one? Food. Good. All right, I'm being sarcastic. The Agriculture Committee. And she was insulted. The Rebbe secretary calls her, says, the Rebbe wants to talk to you. She says, Rabbi, I'm, I'm insulted. This is terrible. You know? Imagine how hard she must have worked to be elected to Congress in 1968. Not only as a woman, but a black woman. She defied all odds. And they stuck her in a, you know, go, go figure out what to do with wheat in the country. Because <laughs> my wheat. The Rebbe said to her, what a blessing God has given you. A blessing? <laughs> like, what do you mean? <laughs> Did I get in a search in the committee? He says, the country has so much surplus food and so many hungry people. That was it. That was our whole conversation. The next day, she meets a guy named Bob Dole. Bob Dole was a senator, Midwest, I forget where, and he was looking for help for the Midwestern farmers. Long story short, 1973, they passed the Agriculture and Consumer Protection Act, basically food stamps. Millions of Americans today are not malnutrition, single moms, mal malnourished children, all of them are getting their food and nutrition because of this woman, because of this one woman. And I'll read to you what she said at her retirement party. And we'll give you the chills. She said, I owe all of this to a rabbi who was an optimist. Who taught me that what you may think is a challenge is actually a gift from God. Disclaimer, she's not Jewish. <laughs> she didn't drink the Kool-Aid. Right? And if poor babies have milk and poor children have food today, it's because this rabbi in Crown Heights had vision. It's the peak end rule. I got to end it now. <laughs> but Bezrat Hashem, let's focus on these things. You know, let's really focus. It's like a muscle. Positive thinking is literally a muscle. The more we practice it, the more we get the hang of it. The more we get it. And if your mind changes, this is from Mrs. Stegels, we'll leave you with this. If your mind changes, your life changes. Everything is here. All right. Thank you, guys.